Hey everyone. We'll Hi everybody. Just a minute here. Um, getting all our ducks in a row. I'm gonna put the uh, the lineup in the group chat. Go. All right, and I'm looking for one more person. Where are they? Uh, not there. There we go. Okay. So thanks for joining us, everyone. Um, we're going to go in here in just a minute. Chelsea has fired the lineup into the chat. We are streaming on the old, what's, what do they call themselves now? It's not Facebook anymore. It's like Meta. We're, oh we're, yeah, it was we're, Meta. We're, we're streaming on Meta. Um, I think they're keeping the Facebook name, but now they're just a giant conglomerate. I think they were giant before, um, but I'll just share the lineup for those who are on uh, Facebook, you can see our lineup and the order there too, in case you're watching this at a later hour. I know we had some guests tonight joining us from um, the West Coast who weren't sure their samples were going to make it in time. And then uh, one of them, uh, oh, one of them uh, sent me a message earlier today saying that they actually got there. So um, that was good news. Anyway, um, a happy Thursday evening. Happy American Thanksgiving to any of you that might apply to. Um, we were talking before we got started here that uh, I, I had American Thanksgiving at my friend's house. His wife is American. My sister-in-law is American. So every once in a while, I get a second Thanksgiving, which is kind of fun. Um, we have got friends joining us from, I can tell here, um, the Ottawa area, possibly Edmonton, for sure Victoria, looks like Edmonton, possibly Kamloops as well, a bunch of other places. So thanks all of you for tuning in to tonight's tasting. Um, we got a really cool lineup here. Oh, Lorraine's in Phoenix, so she's not in Edmonton. That's That sounds a little warmer than Edmonton right now, which is in proper winter. Um, whereas we here in Calgary had 13 degrees today and still don't have any snow on the ground, so. Lucky us. Uh, we've got a special guest host for with us tonight. Um, we are very uh, lucky to have Mike Brisebois on board with us. Uh, Mike was at, for a time, for many years actually, the Bunahaben, Lecheg, Tobermory, Deanston brand ambassador, Black Bottle brand ambassador for Canada. Um, and the crazy thing about it was he was appearing all over the place doing tastings, um, and it was a it was a part time job that he did while well, he had a full time job, um, but he did it very well. Represented those brands, and when we came up with this idea for a Bunahaven tasting, and it was an idea that Evan, Kurt, and I all had more or less simultaneously when we realized we had seven old Bunahaven whiskeys kicking around the shop. Um, the next idea that we had, and I think Evan and I might have both had it simultaneously, and Chelsea might have had this as well, was hey, we should invite Mike to join us. And we're glad he did because, uh, you know, certainly he can tell you more about the distillery than we can. Um, and, oh, we got to make, oh, we've got, we've got some, uh, to share some responsibilities with Evan and uh, Chelsea. I don't know if you can do that. Can you make them co-hosts or do I have to? Uh, I can't, you have to. It's because we switched hosting and co-hosting. Right, right. I was, All the I was almost on it. <laughs> All the wonders of Zoom. Well. Um, I'm, I'm assigning my co-hosts right now. Um, so in addition to Mike Brisebois, who's joining us from Ottawa, before he heads off to Vancouver for special events, um, uh, Mike's joining us. We've also got Evan Eckersley uh, from the shop, Chelsea Colson as well. And for some reason, I can't find Evan's, Evan on the list. Here, there he is, so I can make him co-host. That's already done. Oh, you've already got it. Okay, never mind. And then Kurt's joining us too, but he's uh, he's just along for the ride tonight, as it, as it were. Um, but we're happy to have him too. Uh, so, Mike, thank you very much for joining us tonight and for tackling 271 years of Bunahaven with us. Oh, we still can't. We got to figure figure that out. 
Maybe we have too many co-hosts here. Maybe here, I'm, I'm back. I'm here now. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for uh, thanks for uh, joining us again, Mike. Um, yeah, and I'm just going to go back to putting that co-host in. I don't know why that disappeared, but uh, you are co-host again. So you'll be able to mute and unmute at will. But thanks for joining us tonight, staying up late. Oh, absolutely. My pleasure. Honestly, when you reach out to me and say 271 years of Bunna, I'm like, well, mm -hmm. I'm not going to turn this down. I'm a huge Bunna fan and, uh, you know, going through seven of these with everyone tonight with, with yourselves and uh, geeking out on these and talking a little bit of history and going through the distillery. Uh, it's uh, such a pleasure. I'm usually in bed by now. I got an early flight to Vancouver tomorrow. Um, few events to take place but uh i couldn't miss this one um i got a, a few little tin bits of history i'll showcase before we get into the drams i'll make it quick because uh, i'm pretty excited to dive into these um let's see if i can share my screen here so welcome everyone to the ultimate bunna tasting um I think it's like $14,000 worth of Bunna um, that we're tasting tonight. And I've dove into a few of them and uh, we try to nail down the lineup, which you'll see in the chat. And it's really about elevating the aromas and the flavors as we go along. Uh, when we look back and you think 45 years ago of Bunna, you know, going back to 1968, uh, a lot of things have changed uh, during that time. And uh, we'll go through a few of that right now. So a few of the bottles we're tasting here uh, showcased uh, Port Askeg 45 year. We got a 44, 43. Uh, I think it was a 42, a 40, uh, then a 27. And the one official bottling is the 30 year. And uh, Andrew saved this one exclusively for this tasting. So you're you're going to taste uh, you know, a few sherry bombs and a few uh, awesome like library, old library style um dusty expressions as well so really a flavor explosion tonight diving through these seven whiskeys now bunahaven was established in 1881 and if you look back in the early days 1879 for instance the isla distillers company were searching for the right place to build a new distillery isla was booming at that time and there was a need and a request and a demand for whiskeys from Isla or new make spear from Isla for blenders and the request was to build a distillery that could make up for that demand. Now the Isla Distillers Company wanted to build an Isla with uh, a distillery in Isla but they searched far and wide and they found themselves at the mouth of the Markadale River and they thought this would be the place to build a distillery. In 1881 they broke ground and 1883 the first spirit started distilling off the uh, the stills and in the early days, there was about a million liters a year being distilled at that time. And they had two kilns uh, to dry uh, the barley. And there was actually um, an elevator that was operated by steam. So thinking safety at that time, it wasn't really a thought. But imagine working around steam at times and lifting the elevators and the, and the, and the barley up and down. Would have been quite a scene to see. Uh, I've been searching far and wide to find photos of those elevators, but there's nothing in existence. I want to spend some time maybe in some libraries in Scotland when I can get back over uh, to see if I can find some, because that's one thing that would be awesome to see. Now, Bunnahaven uh, means mouth of the river, and uh, that's really from Scots Gaelic. And that's the one thing with this distillery, everything when it comes to the distillery name to a lot of the expressions that they release, it's all Gaelic. And, and a lot of people from Isla and Scotland really um, love this uh, because it's really keeping true to, her, to their home. Now, getting to the distillery is quite a journey. And for the first 80 years, the only way to get there was by boat. So um, when the distillery was built and many people left the mainland to go work at the distillery, they really left and started something brand new and something incredible and a journey they really sought to, uh, to explore and to start a new life. So I have, a, I have a video here for us to see. A few of you uh, who have attended any of my tastings prior to this, uh, I show this one, but it's really bringing you to Bunna, uh, seeing the still, seeing the distillery, 
A uh, few changes, of course, uh, from this video when it was first done. Uh, one of the warehouses was torn down, um, but uh, majority of everything else is still there. So here it is. The sound of Isla. A body of water that's ingrained in us, in everything that we are. Maturing by its shore, it leaves its indelible salty mark on our whiskies. And it's the waterway that once carried our spirit to the mainland. It was a lifeline. But the sound of Isla is more than currents and waves. It's the sound of peace and escape. It's the sound of creation and the sound of patience. It's the sound of our people. <laughs> and the sound of war. It's the sound of a journey worth making. Discover the sound of Isla. Truly quite something phenomenal to see. And when you drive down that single track road now that was built in the 1960s, um, it could be scary at times. Um, my first trip, I was going, I was going down and we're with a group of 10 of us and it was pouring rain. And, you know, we stopped just to, just about halfway down and uh, we stood out and, you know, had a dram overlooking the sound of Isla. You know, it's just tr something truly phenomenal. It's giving me goosebumps. Like, I feel like I'm going back. And just to think, you know, like operating a distillery and, and distilling about a million liters a year uh, in the early days, you know, the only way again there is by boat. So barley was shipped in, the whiskey left by boat. Um, so really when you're standing at this pier, and this is not the original pier, this was replaced in the 1950s, you're standing at the pier and you smell the salt from the sea. Uh, and I'm, I, when I was there last, I, I closed my eyes and I tried to picture my, the, like the ships coming with the barley and smelling that fresh barley coming in and then smelling the peat fires behind you. Uh, it would have been something truly amazing to actually uh, experience during, during that time. Now, with a single track road built in the 1960s, uh, everything is now trucked in and out uh, from the distillery. They did, until the 1980s, still bring in some of the ships in to, uh, to bring in some supplies, but now it's strictly all by, uh, by transport. Now, here showing the road. Now, it's a single track road, and you know, over the last couple of years, they were stating that Bonahaven was going to actually expand the road to allow two cars to go back and forth. Uh, but uh, that's still in the works. But there's been a good amount of money put in the distillery. Um, you know, Brendan McCarran is now the master distiller. And the one thing he requested uh, when he took over was you've got to paint these buildings. Uh, so they got out and they painted all the buildings white um, to make it, uh, you know, just a little bit of more fashionable if you're uh, looking from the sea. But it truly is a remarkable journey to get there. It's long. And, you know, when you go to Isla for the first time, you're like, you know what? I'm going to hit up Bullmore, Ardbeg, I'm going to hit up Lagavulin. Why do I need to go to Bunna? I'm going to waste like 45 minutes of my time tasting whiskeys uh, at Bullmore, Ardbeg, or any of them. Uh, but those who go to Bunna and experience that journey, uh, after they leave, they, they think themselves, we would have regretted not going. It truly is a remarkable place, historic, and the whiskey is damn good. <laughs> Hey Mike, I got a I got a quick question. Yep. Um, based on the video, are random dudes with beards allowed to just go to the distillery, wander around at will, and open casks? Because that's <laughs> no. that's the, the message I took away from the movie. I thought and I thought that message was inspiring. I, I think uh, I think we should just 
market it that way now. And uh, anyone, I, I, I would take probably five years to grow a beard, but uh, anyone with a beard, let's just go and just, we'll have a copy of the video saying, well, you're marketing it this way that we just jump into warehouse nine and have some drams. <laughs> Mike, you and I can just show up with fake beards. We've yeah. got this. Well, I got one. I, I have one of the fake, I have a fake beard that I, I, I dressed up at the, as the, the helmsman for Halloween. Uh, so I'll just show Ooh. up like that. Maybe they'll give me a free dram. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> they don't even know you. <laughs> no, no. Good thing I'm still pretty good uh, friends with many of them. Um, but one of the other unique things about Bunna, it's the only distillery has its own natural spring water source. Uh, so the Margadale Spring is uh, pumped underground uh, to the distillery and it's unaffected by any peat. So any of the peaty moorlands, there's no um, uh, peat or smoke in from the water itself. Now, this is a beautiful picture of it. It's not that pretty if you actually go visit it. Um, it's just showing a stream, showing its natural spring water is so beautiful. Uh, but it's one of the cool things about Bana being on Isla and not having that peated water influence in the distillation process. Now, everything at Bunna is big, um, from the mash tun to the, the washbacks to the stills, and, and we're starting off the mash tun. It can hold up to 15 tons of, uh, of mash. Uh, they only use about 12 and a half tons at times. I know um, Brandon's looking at increasing that a bit as well, because he wants to try to get some more uh, inventory of uh, some new make spirit and keep some of the core ranges going because uh, that's one of the things that Bunna and not a lot of stock. Uh, a lot of the stock was sold off over the years prior to Burn Stewart uh, owning the distillery uh, and now distill. But yeah, it's a massive mash ton. Uh, the original one is actually at Brook Lottie, uh, which was an open top mash ton before. Uh, so that one is at uh, Brook Lottie. So I always say there's a little bit of Bunna in every Brook Lottie, but that's uh, just my saying. <laughs> Oh, hey, Mike, um, real quick, before we move to the next slide, there were some comments about possibly jumping into a couple of the whiskeys. Yeah. So um, Chelsea suggested to, I know it looks like it was Aram's, Aaron suggesting that we have a dram. So we're starting with the single malts of Scotland, Bunahaven 43 year old. Mm -hmm. And even if you're not drinking them yet, I've been nosing these whiskeys now for a good, you know, 10 minutes or so. I Actually, probably since I poured them about half an hour ago, I've been slowly nosing away at them. And uh, the first three that we have teed up are like tropical fruit bombs. Um, they're delicate, spirit-driven whiskeys. The cask is not um, dominating the show. And uh, yeah, we can maybe intersperse one or two of these into learnings about the distillery. And the once, um, how shall we say this, sad Dickensian, you know, dour distillery that is now going to be pretty and whitewashed um, when we all go see it next. Andrew, I think you have to like stop and take a minute to talk about the glass that you're using. Oh, that is. Yeah. I, I busted out the old school blenders glasses for tonight's tasting. Sadly, I <laughs> only have five at the house. So I uh, only the oldest whiskeys got put in these glasses. They're not the best to drink from, but they look fun and they're they're amazing for the nose because they keep more of it in the glass. I can't lie, those are a game changer when you're nosing old delicate whiskeys. I mean, they're so bloody ugly and stuff, but it's it's like an amplifier. It literally jacks everything up and gives you higher notes. It's really, really cool. Yeah, and Kurt, like for whiskeys like these old, you know, refill cask Buna Havens, they're mm -hmm. perfect. Um, I, the first time I saw these was in, um, Sekinder's boardroom at, at the whiskey exchange or, uh, uh, Elixir Distillers in London. And yeah, I, they're, they're very cool glasses and surprisingly sturdy. Mm -hmm. They're not, they're not as flimsy as I worried they would be, but yes, I as think Jeff pointed out they're tough to clean. I think, um, I think Sukinder and Angus worked together to design those too, didn't they? That sounds correct, yeah. So it's, it's kind of cool that you had like the geekiest of whiskey geeks design the perfect glass for it. Really cool. Ab absolutely. Um, so I'll pull up the details on that one, uh, but Mike and Evan, if you, either of you guys feel like chiming in on the uh, nose and palate 
Mike, I have to say you're making me homesick, man. That video just takes me there. I miss it so much. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I get a little emotional now because I, I, being the brand ambassador prior to now kind of being out of it, uh, yeah, it takes me back. And I, uh, I, 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 one thing I stopped doing recently is saying we, and it's not we anymore, it's them. So, <laughs> yeah. But like, this, I still have a hard time saying that with like every, you make friends everywhere and you're just like we, even though you know it's not a we anymore, you're just like we. <laughs> but the nose on this um, truly shows how well Bunna ages. Um, we're all used to seeing younger Bunnas with those salt influences, you know, those 12, 18, 25. But as Bunna ages, it goes to a whole different level. And that could be being that natural spring water source, kind of taming it over the years as well. But that influence the wood and that essence of how beautiful the whiskey matures just gives it those tropical notes that Andrew was talking about. Bunna has something to, with anything over 40 years. I've had a couple of the Bunna 40s, but the 42, 45, 46 year Bunnas, there's this tropical fruit that comes out and it's phenomenal. And, and it's something you were like, is this is really a Bunna? If you drink this blind, you would not think it's a Bunna. You would think it's a, a, an older space side possibly or an island malt as well. But this is a truly amazing experience for those who have not tasted an older bunna to showcase how it really matures and ages to this beautiful expression in whiskey. You know, yeah, I you're... didn't know. Sorry, go ahead, Evan. Yeah, sorry, Mike, you were talking about uh, the wood and everything and, and salt. And there is this, this really cool sort of salty beech wood note uh, on the, on the nose with it. And those tropical fruits come through and this waxiness that really might reminds me of like a, a more delicate version of a, of an older Kleinlish uh, in a way. Mm. Evan, uh, you actually hit right what I was going to say was what's really catching me tonight, and I didn't pick it up, um, at least not as much when I wrote the tasting note for this, but yeah, it is salty. There is quite an intense saltiness to this whiskey. Um, the nose is just this lush tropical fruit bomb. It's decadent. There's just, it's oozing like pineapple, mangoes, um, like fresh bananas, but the palate has some of that fruit, but it's it's more, a little bit more austere and a little bit saltier than, than I recall. Um, incidentally, this is the bottle, um, the uh, Single Malts of Scotland Director's Special, Boonahaven 43 year old. Um, this is a brand that's owned by Elixir Distillers. Uh, Sikinder Singh, who we were talking about earlier, who along with, uh, um, uh, Angus McRailed um, designed these 1920s style blenders glasses. Um, company that we do a ton of work with, but sadly, this is one that we're down to just a bottle or two. Um, that's all that's left in store and likely all we will ever see again. But there's always something else coming down the pipeline. So um, there's always another one. But the older bunnas are getting harder and harder to find. That's the one thing I have well, to say. There's not a lot in stock. And, uh, you know, many of the independent bottlers, uh, those who pick them up, were very, very lucky uh, because these gems, uh, these mm -hmm. types of expressions we're tasting, we may not see them again. No, no you're, you're definitely right about that. So older whiskeys, things that are more than 20, 25 years of age, like those, those styles are never coming back. And I think you're also correct that there's certain companies that definitely, and you can see it just by virtue of this lineup, Elixir Distillers, Sikinder Singh, really wisely invested in a lot of older Isla whiskeys, not just Bunahaven, but all other distilleries. I believe he has more Isla whiskeys than any other company other than the distilleries on Isla. Um, and then the other one is Signatory. Like Signatory made some very smart buys um in the 90s and the 2000s and they're still living off of those today um mike do you want to show another couple slides or should we jump into the 44 first i, I say we jump in the 44 first okay
I will pull that up on here in just a second. These are perfect to do side by side. <laughs> yeah. Now, what's interesting with these ones is they didn't declare, I don't think the vintage is known on these. We just know the age for some reason. And um, sometimes even when we don't know that, we can find that information on places like Whiskey Base, but I don't believe they've disclosed um, the vintages on these whiskeys. But to be totally honest, I wouldn't be surprised if this is the same parcel that went into the third whiskey that we're gonna try in a minute. Um, but here, I'll share that for everyone on the screen here. Once again, like the 43 year, we're down to just a bottle or two of this in store. It's not quite as bright as the 43 in terms of the fruit leaping out of the glass. It's a little darker. It's going a bit more into to sherry tones. It's going more into like um, some maple syrup and almost even stewed fruits rather than those bright tropical tones. They're still there, but it's not quite as tropical. Yeah, yeah say, I feel like this is like the stewed version of the one we just had. Yeah, this one reminds me a lot more of official bottlings, like getting more of that Christmas cake kind of nose. Mm -hmm. Now I should add, if anybody wants to share their own tasting notes as we go here, ask questions. I know many of you have already been uh, plugging them into the chat. So thanks for that. Um, we'll do our best to address them as they come up. Um, uh, and in terms of Aaron's question, uh, will we start selling these glasses? Potentially, yes. Um, but uh, um, Bernadette, who's with Pacific, who's on this chat tonight, knows as well as anyone that uh, um, the Elixir guys are a, an extremely busy small business that sometimes the best laid plans get uh, dragged out for long periods of time. Um, but anyway, great, great people, very busy. And uh, um, John commenting that the, based on where the prices are headed, these are real bargains. I mean, it is, that is true, John. Um, we could talk about that with the third whiskey because the third whiskey actually recently had a price increase. Mm -hmm. And part of it, that justification was that it was probably underpriced. Mm -hmm. Evan, you've been quiet. What are your thoughts on this one? So it's a little bit more wood forward for me than the, the first one. And like you talked about the Sherry's tones, it definitely has a bit more of that wine hit to it. Mm -hmm. uh, on the nose and you're getting into a little bit more with those dried fruits a little bit more of a, a leathery note going on as well yeah it's it's spicier it is woodier like you said it's earthier um mm -hmm. and even though it has that kind of old antique style that a lot of these whiskeys do it do doesn't have quite the tropical fruit impact that the last one had for me yeah absolutely andrew i had uh the ultimate tasting idea for you What's that? Let's talk to some of these themes. Let's have a full-on whiskey geek chat session. Let's could you mention the saltiness in a 40 plus year old whiskey? You know, it speaks to you know ambient influence and terroir type scenarios. Sure. And then just what you're talking about here, condition of old whiskeys and all this kind of stuff. We could pick some whiskeys that we think exemplify some things that we could have a full-on little debate session. For the real yeah. real geeks. It'd be a fun, fun night, I think. Yeah, dissecting whiskey. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there you go. A lot I would of love to, go I ahead, would, Evan. I would love to see some of these older casks too, like after they were dumped, the insides of it, because I, I wonder if they have like salt rings on them mm. uh, on the insides, or even like uh, if they haven't been moved going into like a stalactite growing from all the, the dripping uh, down, the, down the, from the top. Mm hmm. Kurt, could, could we call that? Would it be too offside to call that like Kensington Wine Market's Whiskey Autopsy Series? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> can we use graphics from like the alien autopsy type stuff and tweak it somehow? Well, we can we can mock that for our marketing. I for love sure. it. I love and by it. we, of course, we mean Chelsea. Yeah. No, I think I think we just redo the, the Six Feet Under uh, title theme that H <laughs> from the HBO series. All right, Mike, let's nerd out on some, some technology. Yep. Um, 
so before we left off uh, in terms of the distillery, here's it's the mash tun, like I was mentioning before. It can hold up to 15 tons, uh, but they, they really just fill it up to 12 and a half tons of mash. Now, the thing with Bunna being so far away, uh, if something breaks down, you can't really just call someone they'll be there right away. Um, so one night, uh, the mash tun actually broke down and Andrew Brown was there, who's the distillery manager and a few of the distillery workers. And they actually had to shovel out the mash by hand. And think about it, it's like 104 degrees Fahrenheit in there. Uh, so they were doing five minute intervals, shoveling out the mash. And once they got it all out, they fixed it and then put the mash back in to keep things going. Um, the, the one thing with, it's not just Bonnet, with every single distillery, those who work there have a huge heart and they care what they're doing. And you can see that right there, especially, you know, jumping in a mash tun and, and shoveling out the mash and, and getting it back up and running because, you know, losing uh, 12 and a half tons of mash is a, is a pretty big investment. So uh, getting that going again was uh, was a big part. And Andrew, uh, if you ever met Andrew Brown, that guy is one of the most, probably the nicest guys I've ever met. And when I was there uh, with him, I was with a tour and here they are, you know, they drank so much Saltown wine the night before and champagne and they go out to Bana and they don't even want to be there. And here I am, you know, talking with Andrew and I'm like, I'm not leaving. You guys are just going to go back to the hotel and fall asleep. So we're just going to stay here. I'm going to stay here and milk this as long as mm -hmm. I possibly can. So most of them were passed out in the van uh, by the time I went back to see them. But uh, the, the biggest recommendation I can give anyone is if you ever get to Bana and you get a chance to speak to Andrew, uh, take all the time you possibly can get from him because he'll share some amazing stories of the distillery. Yeah, he, he, I can vouch. He's a very nice guy and uh, very, very patient. Mm -hmm. um, he's like an old school Isla distillery man. Um, and, you know, there's a handful of guys like that. And you can think of guys like Mickey Heads, mm -hmm. um, James McTaggart, who has moved over to Aaron, just these real very patient, mm -hmm. gentle guys who just, they love what they do and they're soft spoken, but, they're well respected. Yep, yep. And it was a fluke that he actually started working at Bunna because his uh, father-in-law worked at the distillery and he was actually just visiting his in-laws and decided to stay and work at the distillery and moved up the ranks to the distillery manager. So uh, I think it was the greatest thing that ever happened to Bunna uh, with him being there and mm -hmm. just uh, really seeing it through it to where it is today. All right, one more slide and we're going to get into the next one. Um, so another big thing at Bunna is uh, the washbacks. They hold a massive amount of, uh, of, uh, of wash, you know, 66,000 liters. Now, the fermentation time is a little bit different at Bunna. They actually run two different cycles. During the week, it goes about 48 to 60 hours. And then they let it go over the weekend. So a bit over 100 hours. Um, so with that, you know, with the new make spirit, you're getting a combination of different kinds of flavors. Stephen Woodcock, uh, when he was the master distiller, uh, he spent a lot of time really educating me on fermentation process. And he believes that a lot of the flavor comes pre-distillation. Uh, so shorter fermentation time, you get more of those cereal notes, longer fermentation time, more fruit notes come out. Um, so with Bana having that dual, um, you kind of get a mix of both. Uh, so what they do is after distillation, they marry the two together. Uh, so you're getting a, a 48 hour to 60 hour mash, a hundred hour mash distilled and then married together uh, and matured. Uh, so that's one little cool thing about uh, Bonnehaven. And we'll get into our next whiskey. This next one is an absolute um, stunner. It's one of my favorites. Uh, and this is one that uh, I've had the pleasure of enjoying many times. Um, Port Askeg, like the Single Malts of Scotland, is a brand that is owned by Elixir Distillers. Um, they source the liquid. And for a, a solid year or so, anytime I was uh, at a whiskey show in London or Paris, I'd show up at the stands and Oliver Chilton, uh, who's I think the whiskey director for Elixir distillers would basically see me coming and pull a bottle out from behind the, um, the stand and pour me a generous helping of it. And it was the Port Askeg 45. And he'd always give me a healthy serving of it because he knows I love it. 
and delicate old whiskeys like this really need to be enjoyed when your palate is still fresh this is not something even though this could be the marquee bottling in a tasting to tuck at the back end of it because it is light it is delicate it's 40.8 percent if i remember correctly it was a marriage of i believe five sherry butts uh yeah that's it from 1968 mm -hmm. um some of those were clearly below 40 percent which is probably a big part of why this was put together as a marriage rather than a single cask as well um you know whiskeys lose strength over time typically one to two percent a year and um they can get very close to 40 percent or fall below it and then they're no longer legally whiskey unless you have more of that same whiskey that you can marry together with it to bring that strength back up mm -hmm. and I, this is bottled at like a perilously low cask strength 40.8 percent um and yeah i i love this whiskey yeah it's it's really cool how it's it's almost a combination of the first two where um, you do get a bit of that sherry influence, but the tropical notes are still there. There's this mm -hmm. oily saltiness to it all, and it's got this great uh, nuttiness on the finish as well that comes in. Yeah, this is uh, remarkable. Uh, I've had the the pleasure to taste the Bona 46, and, which is right here, uh, and I would buy three of these over this Bona 46. And the Bunna 46 is 10,000 retail. Um, the, when you look at, like, it tastes almost exactly the same as a 46. Well, and, and I think this also illustrates, you know, we had two single casks leading into this, and this is a marriage, that the whole point of that, I mean, costs of scale for companies. You can't just bottle single casks all the time and make it economical, especially, especially not at a reasonable price point. But... The point of blending casks together is that all those different um, elements that you're putting in are going to add to the complexity and the depth of the overall product. And in the case of the, the 43 and the 44 versus the 45, I think you're seeing, you know, three exceptional, three very good Bunahabans. But to me, the 45 year old stands out because it's just got that greater depth and complexity, as Evan was saying. And this is, I believe, 1968. It was distilled uh, mostly all 1968. So this would have been mostly second fill uh, sherry casks. Mm -hmm. We have a question from Aaron. Um, he thought Port Port Askeg was Buna, or he thought Port Askeg was Kalila, not Bunahaven. Um, Port Askeg is just an Isla single malt brand. Mm -hmm. So um, it's understandable why people assume that Port Askeg means Kalila, because the distillery is located right next to the. <laughs> port, the harbor, the hamlet of Port Askeg. Um, but, but it's simply, they'll, they'll bottle Isla whiskeys under that label. Some of them, they know the origin. Many of them, they don't. They don't know where the whiskey's from. They just know it's an old Isla whiskey. And then they'll bottle it under the Port Askeg label. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised, Andrew, if that 12-year autumn edition we have right now was a Hoven a peated uh, Bunahaban? Yeah, I, and I'm not saying it is. I, I think it's Kalila based on everything I've read, but there's mm -hmm. something about it that hits the tongue a little bit differently than Kalila does. I think we've had many discussions about what we think the Kalila characteristic is. There's something that's slightly Bona-ish about it. Well, that's a, it's a good point, Kurt, because there was also times when um, Bunahaban was producing for Diageo because Kalila was shut down right? and, and may have been distilling Kalila malt spec as opposed to their own peated malt spec. Um, I know one year when I was there and Andrew told me um, kind of, you know, somewhat, you know, in hushed tones that 70% of their production that year was going to Diageo because wow. they were willing to buy it out. So that stuff happens from time to time, not often, probably not anymore, but. Um, I think there's a fair few society members in this group and Evan can probably attest to this. Um, and Andrew now probably too a lot more because we do a lot more of these now than we did when we were doing them in the shop. Um, when it came to a lot of the peated society releases that came at the back end of the lineup, 
when there would be a Kalila or a Bonahaven. There was an awful lot of guesses in either direction. Yeah. We, those young spirits are, they're fairly close and characteristic, to be honest. So. Yeah, especially like when you get into, and Mike, feel free to jump in and, and yell at me for my pronunciation of this. I, I think it's either <laughs> Stoisha or Stisha. The, uh, the the most recent of what we've seen from uh, heavily peated Bunahaven bottles or, or casks. Um, a lot of what I've tried, which is like 2012, 2013 uh, casks from there, especially if you're looking at X bourbon, uh, definitely have that sort of salty, oily character that uh, very much can come off as Kalila in style. Yeah, the, the Kelbonic was for sure first fill bourbon. So you really got a lot of that salt fresh mm -hmm. barley influence that can replicate to others. Uh, I wish they would have kept it going. Uh, mm -hmm. That's the one thing. Uh, that was a hidden gem that got discontinued and I think it was a big mistake. Yep. And what is the correct pronunciation, Mike? Kilbonic? No, for, no, for uh, Stoisha or Stisha for the, uh, the actual distillate, that, what they called it for a couple of years there. Uh, Stoisha? Still issue. Still issue? That yeah, makes sense. Bang on. <laughs> I wish they had just stuck with, you know, when you go talk to them there, David Brody will be the first one to tell you. They, their unpeated production is Bonahaven, their peated production they call Moigna, which I think is Gallic for either peat or turf, or I can't remember what term, maybe peat, is it? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I wish they would just literally divide by those streams yeah. and yeah. they could have names, like sub names almost within those. But it would keep it nice and clean for people instead of, you know, you've got the Tachikaga, you've got the Kiabanak, you've got this, 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 all these things that everybody's like, well, is it peated or unpeated? And those yeah. of us on the front lines that are lucky enough to be at somewhere like KWM where we open a lot of these, we know. But I feel for the retailers that don't open a lot of products because it's not super clear what is peated and unpeated, but not nowadays. It's funny because Canada is the only market that doesn't get Monia. Uh, so mm -hmm. the yeah. ammonia Bordeaux uh, and the rest of the world as well. And I think that would have helped uh, like Toichika Ga Kilbonic, 100% agree. Like you don't know if it's Peter or not. You just think it's Bun and you used to Bun a 12 and it's unpeated. Uh, but the rest of the world is getting the Moignas. Um, So mm -hmm. they got the Moigna Brandies that was released a few years back and the Moigna Bordeaux. And if you go to Warehouse 9, it specifically states it. If you ever get the chance to, it's, it's mm -hmm. Moigna or not. Um, so I agree. They should. Uh, but Canada is just not a, a big market for Bunna, um, and it's it's getting worse. Uh, yeah. And allocations are dropping even more, um, which I think is sad. But I'll keep my personal opinions. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I agree. They should market it more uh, as well for the Moinia and and the unpeated. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting, especially when you consider their their sister distillery is Torbomori, where they they do delineate like that and call the peated stuff Lechig. Nailed it. I was going to make that point. Yeah, you just yeah. nailed. It. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's not like we have. We're, I mean, we're seeing a ton of young peated Bunahaven from independent bottlers. Yeah. So I think in a way, it's just kind of sad that we're not seeing more of it from the distillery because. If there's enough of it to be traded off, then surely there must be enough to bottle and spread around. Yeah. Well, I know Brandon McCarran is really fighting hard to keep more for official bottlings. And little side note, Bunna has been experimenting with higher uh, PPM. Uh, so they're really trying to release a higher peated expression. I know a little bit went into the Black Bottle 10 year and the Black Bottle, uh, one of their new limited editions, I think it's the Smoke one. So mm -hmm. a little bit went into that. So it's just over three years. So they're experimenting with that one there. So I know there's a question if Black Bottle 10 is going to come to Canada. I highly, highly doubt it. Um, mm -hmm. There's no interest in bringing any other than just a regular Black Bottle in Canada. That was the discussions pretty much every day when I was there. Mm -hmm. Hey, Mike, they need they a name uh, for their heavily peated or heavy, heavy peated. They should call it Dectamore, yeah. where, it's, where it's two more than Octomore. <laughs> yeah. Or, or Evan, I was going to say Hypernova. Yeah. Hypernova is be good too. Yeah. yeah. So, so last the only time, thing. Sorry. Go ahead, Kurt. I was going to say last time I was there, we had a really awesome guy, Sarah. I don't know if you know Sarah. Yeah. Right? Yep. Um, really, really sweet and incredibly funny too. She was brilliant. Um. She said they are doing 17 and a half weeks of peated a year. 
Mm -hmm. Average peating level for those ones we were just talking about is 40 ppm. And they're now doing 90, yep. 90 ppm. That's crazy. Yep. yep, that's right. There was a, uh, a demand. So there was a, a special order from uh, somebody uh, for uh, <laughs> uh ppm so yeah there was a 90 ppm that was requested and bana decided to keep some and mature it uh so eventually you should see something i think it's only about four years old now um so maybe in the next maybe when it's seven or eight years you may see something uh i'm excited for that yeah uh, to put it in perspective to those that may not know um our bag consistently sits at the highest at 55. The Freud seems kind of dirtier and bigger most of the time, and it's at 45. So this is literally double La Freud. That's insanity. That's Octomore type levels. The first Octomore I think was at 80 PPM and then they went up from there. But think about Bonnehaven, think about all, everything we love about Bonnehaven, Octomorized. Like at the very least, I want a bottle to try it. That's amazing. Yeah, no, it'd be really cool to see for sure. Um, this is literally the last slide and then we're just really getting into all whiskey. Um, I just wanted to show the stills. I know we saw it in the, in the video, but uh, the stills at Bun are, are massive. Um, and what I love about it is that they don't, they're not shiny. When you visit Bunna, now it's sad that you're going to see white painted buildings because the great thing about Bunna was like you feel like you're walking into a distillery still from like the early 1900s. It's, it's aged, it's old, it feels like you're going into a different time. So the painted buildings aside, when you walk in, you still kind of feel that. And if you've ever been to Deanston, Deanston, like the, everything is so shiny and beautiful. Bunna, you really feel like it's a working distillery. And, uh, you know, the stills are what they are. They're not shine. You see it, that they're aged, they're worked, and uh, they really create an amazing spirit. Um, Bunna doesn't produce a lot. Like you're getting two and a half million liters a year. 80% uh, of that goes to blends and the rest stay um, for single malts. Like I said, Brendan's looking at increasing that. Uh, but again, there's a need for more warehouse space. There's only about 20,000 casts at Bunna at the distillery. So it's not a lot to keep, um, you know, a lot going. That's why you do see a lot more limited editions coming from the distillery. Uh, One-offs here. Uh, but you saw, I don't know if you realized, like the new limited editions this year, you may get some in Canada. I, I heard rumors that the Bunna is coming, but I don't know about the others. But a few years back, Bunna limited editions were 1,400 bottles. Now they're getting into the others, 14,000, 15,000 limited editions. And I, I don't really call that a limited edition, but... Um, but yeah, it's, it's starting to increase. So you should see maybe a bundle of limited editions, but I don't think you'll get the others. Um, but yeah, it's uh, for sure. It's uh, a fun place. It's cool expressions and it's, it's really a historic place to visit. Um, Robin Morton is the stillman at the distillery. He's retiring this year. So he's been at the distillery, I believe just over 40 years. And um, the guy is just a gem. Uh, over the pandemic, I, I communicate with him almost weekly, uh, just sharing stories of his time uh, shoveling barley off the ships and bringing them by wheelbarrow into the distillery. Um, so there's just so much history at this distillery that really makes it that much more phenomenal. And we'll see more of that as we taste the last four whiskeys. So uh, if there's questions on the distillery, by all means, I'll keep an eye on the chat and uh, I'll answer them as they go. But it's a distillery that really takes you back in time when you're there and you're going down that single track road and you kind of just take it all in. And then you get into warehouse nine, which is the actual, where the malting floors were. Uh, so if, if anything, I wish they would just actually bring the malting floors back in and just see how it really would be. But uh, that warehouse nine experience is truly a, a fantastic time. And David Brody, if you get him, it's either you're in trouble or you're not, but it's, it's, he's a gem. And, uh, you know, you, you see it in the whiskey, you see it in the people. And that's, I think that's what makes this distillery truly phenomenal and special. You, uh, you do have a question in the chat from Jeff. Mm -hmm. um, he's just saying if the mash tun was, uh, or it's just saying it sounds like you're filling the mash tun twice per day. No, it's, I think they do four or five mashes a week. <laughs> yeah, because it's, 
12.5 tons and produces 2.5 million liters, 625 mash tons a year ish. Yeah, I, I, I'm god awful at math. So like <laughs> Jeff is like, I read that and it was like, this is way over my head. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. Yeah. I, I don't think it would translate like that because uh, there's not a direct one-to-one -one correlation be between what goes into the still and what comes out the other side. Mm -hmm. um, you're really just getting the evaporation uh, recondensed uh, mm -hmm. from the stills and not the whole mash going through it. Mm -hmm. And there's and also, also a direct correlation between isla time and our time, so <laughs> you can't really make sense of how it works. Things are just different there. Yeah. I was going to say, going back to that mash ton, when I worked at Eau Claire, like they had to shovel everything out by hand. And like, obviously their mash ton is a fraction, but you would watch the distillers just sweating as they were shoveling everything out of the mash ton. And they'd always look at me and I'd be like, oh, that looks tough. And they're like, yeah, do you want to help? And I'm like, no, <laughs> like not even remotely. <laughs> So I couldn't imagine doing that with something that's like 17 times the size of that. It mm -hmm. is hot. Mm -hmm. Like, no. <laughs> Hard pass. <laughs> um, John was uh, commenting here that he felt touring around Bunahaven was like, you know, that it was steampunk. You know, I, I, I kind of, I think I loved something about Bunahaven was that it, you know, and unfortunately, for better or worse, it's going to, it's getting a bit of TLC that maybe has been overdue for quite some time. But I, I always thought of Bunahaben as the ugly duckling of Isla because the, the, the buildings itself were just drab, frankly, almost dreadful. Like they could stand in as like POW camps in World War II or something like they're just, just kind of, and then you go through the distillery and the stills are like, they're so rusty. You could strike a match on them. Um, and every other distillery you go to, the stills are perfectly polished and that has absolutely no bearing on the quality of the spirit. It's just a, a visual aesthetic. The patina and, has a patina. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, so I just, there was a charm in that, a charm in this, like, you know, I forget that the, there's, there's this big burly stillman and one of my, one of my guests and one of my tours asked why the stills weren't polished. He said, why would we waste our time polishing them? That yeah. doesn't change the whiskey. So Sarah that I was just mentioning earlier that Mike knows, and you guys, if you saw her, you'd probably know her too. You've been there a couple of times. Um, she says, we like to say we're not old, we're scruffy. <laughs> and when you get there, scruffy is a perfect way to describe the distillery. It's just, it's homey, it's comfortable, it's old, it's beaten up. It's, you know, you don't feel bad putting a ding in it kind of thing. And you just feel more at home there for it. It's kind of cool. I think it, it like for Isla distilleries from from what I've I've seen them all in some shape or form in my first time there and uh, it is Bunahaven is just an anachronism where it's it, it it could be any time there as you were talking about Isla time and and it would look the same but that's the cool thing about it too is it really shows how um, the base concept and the base implementation of pot still distillation has not changed for centuries mm -hmm. um and and it doesn't have to like it's it's intentionally inconvenient in mm -hmm. the how and how they do it and that's what makes it so interesting i think it's time for our next whiskey yeah so like on idea. to the boutique i think is number four yeah yeah so the youngest whiskey of the of the bunch at 27 years old and it's and it's got an outdated sketch of the distillery on the label too. Yeah. I I actually I don't I think we asked Dave Worthington that when we did a tasting with him recently if he was going to be updating the label, and that that was apparently up to the artist. So, um, to to be confirmed. And I think there's a bigger version of the label. Here we go. Oh, yeah. You can see an exaggerated version of the uh, drive down to the distillery. Um, and probably an uncharacteristic beach party for Isla as well. <laughs> yeah, that's when I was there. It definitely wasn't that bright uh, out. It was like uh, like what you would expect from the coast of Isla, where it was just gray and rain actually being thrown in our faces for part of the time, mm -hmm. uh, and, and it just it it really added to the atmosphere there. 
Mm -hmm. Well, and, and not only that, Evan, uh, um, anyone who's been there, or who's taken the ferry to Jura will know, even on uh, the calmest of days, the Gulf of Cory Vrecken, or not the, or sorry, the, the Sound of Isla has a rather vigorous current. Mm -hmm. I mean, it might as well be a river when it's not going in one direction or the other. Mm -hmm. So 27 years old, this is the batch 18 um, bottling of the Boutique Whiskey Company's Bunahaben. So they've done quite a few batches from the distillery and they don't really tell us the cask type or anything else like that. Um, but the label features the distillery with a terrifying track that snakes down. Um, and uh, from batch to batch, the scene on the beach changes apparently. So those are the, the key facts that we know about this. Oh, and the alcohol strength is 42.6. Yeah, again, on the low side, but it's got that, that juiciness uh, on the palate uh, that the, the Porta Skate 45 had just uh, in, in a younger style. And maybe just a touch of peat in there too versus what I got off the last ones. Yeah. I'm, I'm getting some nice chocolate tones, a bit of saltiness, some sort of like starting to move in that tropical direction as well too. Mm -hmm. I don't think as much as the 43 or the 45 for me, but it's a lovely, again, spirit driven whiskey, just looking at the color of it. Yeah. The fruit notes here are, are still on that sort of younger, like it's juicy fruit. It's not like an actual fruit. It's, it's mm -hmm. the, the, the all fruit flavor that you're getting on there. Pure juicy fruit, but I'm, I'm getting more deeper notes on the mm -hmm. notes as well. I'm also finding there's there's a kind of thick coconut cream vanilla. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if this was sherry, this is probably an American oak sherry cask that's been seasoned. Um, I don't think probably this is that. Too. Probably refill too. I don't think this is that classic European oak sherry because it's just not dark or deep enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, going in that vanilla side of things, a little bit of angel food uh, cake in there as well on the nose. Mm -hmm. Evan, maybe it's because you've got one still quite rather little guy. Anytime you say angel food cake, all of a sudden I go to arrowroot cookies. Mm -hmm. um, the palate's showing a little bit of that sherry tannin, a little bit of leather. Yeah. Saltiness again as well. Some nice spices too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah a little bit more along with that saltiness just that coastal sort of ozone note mm. in there for me as well you know what it has for me that's a little different from the last three is there seems to be a bit and i maybe i'm looking too too much into this but it seems to be thicker it seems to have more of a viscosity to it than the older mm -hmm. ones do yeah i feel the same and yep. I wonder if that's maybe a change in distillation technique that happened at the distillery between when these were made in the 60s and when this was, was presumably made in, I'm guessing, the 90s. Yeah, I, it must have been, especially like Burns Stewart. Well, I'm trying to think, Edrington didn't really run the stills that often. <laughs> so I think they ran it two weeks a year when they had it. Um, so it would have been Burns Stewart that really would have focused on it. But no, even that, no, it would have been, uh, it's interesting to see who would have actually distilled it. But yeah, for sure, the distillation times would have changed over the years, especially from the 60s to now. Well, not mm -hmm. just that, but even fermentation times back yeah. then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they would have been all short. They would have been the, the basic 60 <laughs> or less. And salty too. I mean, you know, if I was tasting these whiskeys in a lineup with other things that were coastal, I don't know that I would find I was picking up on that maritime tinge quite as much. Yeah. Yeah, there's even just a, a touch of like mint menthol going into uh, fisherman's fr fisherman's friends on the on the boutique version as well. Fisherman's for me. friends is a good note. 
I, um, I think another reason the port asking is so good is, you know, distilled in 68, the same time as the old acquaintance. So maybe there's some resemblance there, but. <laughs> Well, you know, in a lot of tastings, that one would stand out. I mean, it, it's a lovely whiskey, but kind of hard to follow in the wake of 43, 44, and 45 year old um, elder siblings. Mm -hmm. Should we try another older one with the signatory uh, 73? Yeah, um, we could move on. Why don't we move on to the signatory 73? Um, so the next two we have are, are both from Signatory, which is an independent bottler based in Pit Lockery. They own the Edredour Distillery. And you can tell from the next two whiskeys that uh, the cast types are, are rather divergent. Just based on the color, you can see quite a difference. So first up is the Signatory Bunahaven 1973. I'll share the link and put it up on my screen. There we go. That nose um, is wonderful. Yeah, distilled in 1973. This was bottled uh, at 42 years of age. Um, I'm guessing by that logic, then it was probably bottled in, I'm gonna guess 2016, 2016. Um, not likely 2015, because this was, was originally distilled late in the year in 1973. Um, and, it's got the, like a musty dunnage warehouse yeah. mushroom. Savory for sure. Like mushroom for, I was thinking too, like a combination of, of chicken and miso uh, mm. itchy band packets for me. And you can almost smell the rusty stills at the distillery. Mm -hmm. It's dusty, leather, chocolate. It's salty again. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, bang on Chelsea with umami. <laughs> Thanks, Jordy. Jordy's fact checked the bottling date for us. So 11 2016. Yeah, there's like this meaty. I don't want to say sulfury, but there's almost something like a st stinky dunnage note yeah. to it, like really old oak. Well, it's yeah. really interesting considering it's it's not far off in age versus the first three. Mm -hmm. But even like it's 6% or so ABV higher, give or take on all of them. And it's so much like burlier in style. Mm -hmm. I like those old sherry notes in it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Evan, th this makes me wonder if there was a switchover between late 60s and early 70s. Maybe they went from Brewer's East to Distiller's East. Um, maybe they, who knows, sped up or slowed down fermentation times in the 70s because they weren't in as big a rush or maybe they were in more of a rush. Um, and it's, I'm just, I'm looking at the tasting notes I wrote, I wrote, which would have been from a Glen Cairn glass. And I can see some of the notes that I have in there, but man, it's almost like this is a completely different whiskey from when I nosed it, when these bottles were cracked about eight weeks ago to pour the samples for the tasting. That's cool how that can happen. And like, even in nosing it with all those, those sort of umami notes in behind that there, there's just a faint touch of what you get out of the uh, SMOS uh, 43, especially in the Porta Skeg 45, where where you can see those those tropical notes trying to sing out, but they're they're just drowned out by those umami notes, uh, possibly from the cask and and just from where it was in the warehouse more than anything else. Yeah, and I, and I, Evan, I like because I'm struggling to even get some of the things you're talking about. I'm, I'm just, you know, I think this is a good example of how different the vessel. Yeah. The shape, like the vessel can be in, in, I almost feel like the glass I'm using for this tonight is, is too much for this whiskey. Like, <laughs> um, Again, part of that geek tasting. We talked about. Yeah. Like, 
this is nothing like the way I nosed and taste it. Like I have a vi very vivid memory of writing the tasting note for this one. I think in there it said, this is sit down and take notice, take your time whiskey, yeah. old school from the first whiff. And I'm not finding this as old school this time around as I did when I finished off the heel left over from pouring the samples. Context is king, man. Like when you, you've already had three other 40 plus year olds. Andrew, what I'm going to do is I saved a little bit. I'm going to use my blender's glass next time and I'll see if I find a difference. <laughs> yeah, let me know because uh, I mean, I'm still really enjoying it, but it also could be, the, again, referring back to where we started that maybe out of context, it's spectacular, but when compared with other things, it's kind of okay. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the 40, the Smos, were those, I forget, were those single casks or batches? The 43 and 44 are single casks. Yeah. Okay. To so, the best of my knowledge. To yeah. The, the, the Portis Keg 45 and the, the, the uh, Boutique were both batches. And now we're back into single cask. And even that could change well, the style quite a bit. Evan, this is where things get a bit murky because... Um, this, the boutique whiskey company claims not to bottle single casks, but they do it all the time. They just don't like to acknowledge single casks versus small batch, mm -hmm. um, for whatever reasons, we won't question them on that. They've got yeah. their own, they've got their own prerogatives. Um, but yeah, no, it's, this is still lovely. It's just not wowing me as much as mm -hmm. it did when I wrote the tasting note. So I'm dying to know, cause it's the first time I've had this whiskey in this glass the next one, which I, I'm guessing based on color, Mike is already on to nosing. Um, now, I was triply, triple excited about this whiskey. Um, first, because it's distilled the greatest year ever, 1978. We all know that. 78 is, is legendary. Second, it was bottled at 40 years of age. So this was a must-have when it came around for my 40th. Um, also, the scores on it were excellent. And then um, the first time I had this, it was just like, wow, this is a dynamite sherried Boone yeah. oven. Chelsea says 88 was better. I, I, I don't agree with her, but I do have to say that uh, 78 was the best year up until yeah. 78. Eight, 80, eight, 88, 88 was a good year, um, but hard to appreciate if you were born in 88 because you wouldn't have met Eddie the Eagle Edwards at Canada Olympic Park, for example. Well, Chelsea has gotten a few 88 uh, samples of Bunna from me. So she's got some birth year with you as well. <laughs> All right. I'm saying, just saying. <laughs> it's, there's tons of chocolate on this going into kind of Christmas cake territory. Yeah. I'm also getting like, uh, um, what do you call it when they like, that's that, that style of cooking when they like slow, like slow cook the bison meat for like, three days so that it's like falling off the bone when you touch it um, i'm not braising yeah, it might be slow like... braised but it's just it's oh man it's it's just got that nose of that like kind of melt in your mouth old slow coked cooked bison yeah it's uh it's it's got that a uh, weird combination of uh of like black licorice plus red licorice at the same time for me where I'm getting the berry fruit notes and the and the sort of aniseed notes on there, at, uh, both hand in hand. Well, just before you said that, Evan, I was thinking, oh, it's been served with like a, a, a like a, a jus reduction of berry fruits mm -hmm. and maybe some yeah. brandy, mm -hmm. maybe a bit of port. Throw some port yeah. in there. I get so much wine influence in this one. The yeah. sherry influence is just right on me. Fresh baked goods. That chocolate is really overpowering, but it's, uh, yeah, it, it, this is ch cherry bomb category. <laughs> mm -hmm. I almost get like a, like if you could infuse like red wine into chocolate mousse, like a dark chocolate mousse. Yeah. Or maybe some like stewed dark berries on top of dark chocolate mousse. Mm -hmm. So... I'll share my screen here in just a second. Uh, this particular release was part of the uh, signatory 30th anniversary collection from a few years back. 
we've had this through the shop more than a few times and it's currently on pre-order but i have two bottles coming in tomorrow not tomorrow sorry uh wednesday because a retailer in edmonton committed to them and then didn't take them which was good news for me because we had six come in a few months back and they sold out very quickly so definitely happy to see a few more of these come through the shop but there are two arriving on wednesday at the shop now Remind me, Evan, before we're done, I wanted to make a comment on pricing on that Port Askeg 34 because yep. it's sort of tied into a comment that was made earlier. Um, uh, 43, sorry, or 45. Uh, the Port Askeg 45, yeah. Yeah. Um, Palette wise, with the Sherry 2 on this, it's, uh, it's it's got some big chewy notes uh, along with those berry fruits again mm -hmm. uh, in a really cool manner. Still beefy. I'm getting some... Uh, Notes of treacle, toffee, uh, mm -hmm. Christmas cake uh, as well. Still a little bit of that, that beefy bison uh, meatiness coming through. And uh, yeah, it's a, again, it's a different whiskey with this glass. It is crazy. I, you know, Curtin, again, well, maybe this can be a topic for whiskey autopsy or whatever we're going to call it, you know, whiskey dissection. Um, I love these glasses for nosing, but I don't think I like the taste of the whiskeys coming out of them. I think something's lost. Might as well just go back to a tumbler, man. Gotta, go back, to my, gotta go back to my cut crystal Glen Cairns. The boys. Anyway, that is uh, whiskey number six. Um, before we go on to the last one, Mike, um, you know, whiskeys like this 30 year old release, which obviously came to Canada extremely limited. Um, you know, do you, do you have a sense, like how rare are these things are from a global standpoint when they get put out? There wasn't a big allocation, even release. Um, I know when it came to Canada, I think it was 30 cases that came to mm -hmm. Canada mm -hmm. and, uh, I remember it was like, okay, how do we div divide it up and where does it go and everything? And I'm like, honestly, just send it to Alberta. Like just send it to Alberta because if the LCBO gets it, it will be released in a year and a half. They're going to hold it in the warehouse. They'll be released in a year and a half and no one's going to get it. Um, so I was very lucky to be able to convince uh, the team to just send it to Alberta because that's where I thought, it would get there quick. It would mm -hmm. con almost like team up with the release when they did it in the UK uh, and not be dragged out forever. But it was it was pretty limited, Andrew. It wasn't. Uh, we didn't see uh, when I was there a, a mass amount of it. It'll be a very limited release, even though they call it a core range now. It's mm -hmm. not. Yeah. Well, I remember when it came in. Um, I tucked it away in my office, and I remember Kurt came in one day to talk to me about something and and like a golden retriever with a squirrel he's like what's that and i was like i don't want to talk about that he's like well, well tell what's going what's the deal with it i was like i don't know what i'm going to do with it yet i'm too busy to, to think about this and they only you're being like too kind Andrew. two bottles i immediately said can i have it <laughs> i was told no but you know what it's i have so much whiskey here andrew was like the scolding parent he was 100 percent right and it's way better to do it with like 25 people so it was the right decision or yeah, next time you want to split some buna haven like you and i can just split all the buna <laughs> it's, it's a standing date i think we also have a good bottle of balvenie to open together at some point too it's, yeah so. church <laughs> chelsea just come to ottawa i have plenty <laughs> don't tempt me mike i've got some vacation days i will use next year and a flight yeah. credit and i will happily be over there your yeah. family will not enjoy me no no and you can, oh good and you can go see your dad yeah we've got yeah. this see i'm coming got next this. year it's covered yeah. I, I have um, to have john lark over because uh i gotta spoil him with some bonus <laughs> there you go <laughs> oh well, um I take this moment to say thank you to, trip to mike's place <laughs> The last time I was at Andrew's place for a staff party, um, you guys know the guy. He's generous to a fault. We were cruising around the house as he tends to do. It reaches a point when a, a staff party, he goes, okay, everybody grab a whiskey glass and go touring the rooms to find a dram. And uh, when we came to the basement and found uh, an open bottle of 
going to have in 40 year old he was absolutely yeah you guys got to try this um man that's still one of my favorite whiskeys i've ever had so that was a brilliant night yeah it, it was a little rough on one of our newer staff members though <laughs> i think i remember seeing say- a picture Okay, he wanted to go drinking with the big dogs. <laughs> yeah, I'm that surprised was, you didn't bring right up after. The, I missed that. <laughs> I'm that surprised one? you didn't bring up the sick burn that Cam. Yeah, had. that's the one. That's the one I've got. Yeah, that's the yeah. one. In the wooden tube, the, yeah. the bizarre wooden tube that screws shut. Yeah. Um, okay, Boone having thirty. Mike, tee this one up because I'll be honest, it came in. I didn't even want to think about it. I was like, <laughs> we're just going to put it in a tasting at some point. I literally don't know anything about it um other than it's the only ob in our lineup tonight yeah well i remember when i think i was messaging you saying okay i made sure that i got a couple bottles for kensington um when this one got released and uh i was pretty excited because you know we don't see a lot of older bana official bottling site yeah they got a 40 year i don't think you'll ever see the new bottling come to canada um the 46 came uh, there was one bottle in alberta and the rest was at bc liquor stores but when the 30 year came out, it was like, hey, this is exciting. Um, matured exclusively in Sherry Cast. And it's kind of showcasing a little bit of like that 18 year that we love, but just amplified. And it's, I'll share my screen here. I was able to hold some uh, stuff from my last job. <laughs> some intellectual property. Yeah. <laughs> Chelsea, does that bottle look familiar? So that's the bottle there. Um, I muted. Yeah, it does indeed. <laughs> not not a lot was released. And we're, I honestly, I say fortunate that 30 cases came to Canada because um, we know uh, and we've seen over the years, allocations for Bunna is just dropping more and more. You'd be lucky to find a Bunna 18 uh anywhere because that's when it was first came out it was just well anytime it's landed it's gone right away so this one kind of showcases everything we love about bunna in the official bottlings like it almost combines everything from the 12 18 and 25 uh but just on a, a heavier level um so it's creamy you're getting that sherry influence a little bit of those caramel notes a little bit of butterscotch that we love with the 25 year and and just amplifies on those heavy characters uh, it's ball at 46.3%. It's unchill filtered, natural color. And that's the going thing for all the core range of Bunna. It's 46.3, unchill filtered, natural color. And uh, you're going to see some similar flavor profiles from the independent bottlers that we've tasted before. Um, and the beauty that we like uh, of Bunna matured exclusively on the, uh, at Bunna Haven on the uh, Isle of Isla, right by the sea. And you get to see those true essence of flavor profile. So yeah, darker colors, similar to the last whiskey we had. Um, that those stewed fruits really come out and nice essence on the nose. Not a true, not a big sherry bomb on the nose. You get those salt influence. You get that creaminess. And then that true beauty of salty beauty, leather, bunna of the older expression. I'm dying to try this whiskey. Um, tonight's not the night for me, just medication mm-hmm. and stuff, but uh, the 25 is one of my all time favorite whiskeys just for like that total comfort zone kind of thing for me. It's been so influential in my life. I think a couple of you guys know I've written a couple of books in my life. The Bunna Haven 25 disguised as just a bottle of single malt with the XXV on it or something was in the first book I ever wrote because I absolutely adore that whiskey. Um, so at some point, if, uh, if anything ever good comes of writing, <laughs> if I ever make a dollar at it, then uh, I'll be cracking a bottle of 25 to celebrate. Mm-hmm. That's great. That's great. The 25, which was amazing, it, it's, it's so delicate and rich. Yeah. Um, and the finish is dry. Uh, so for me, when I, had a 20, when I have a 25-year bunna, it's hard to have a second one because it's even more dry. The difference between the 25 and the 30, the 30 isn't as dry on the finish or the finish is a little bit longer. And those essences of deep fruit notes that we love about Bana is there. Um, and it just continues on. 
the salt not overpowering but it's almost like a salted caramel and I, i'm reading the notes here but it is almost like a salted caramel note that comes out and i think that's what i love about the 18 uh but this just kind of brings it up a, a level yeah Jeff's, for me uh, I, uh, sorry go ahead andrew no no Evan, you talk because jeff was just commenting on some aesthetics there but you let's talk about the whiskey you go first yeah. So for me, like I, I tend to be a single cast guy uh, whenever I have the choice of something uh, to have just because I, I love the, the individuality of each one. But this, uh, this kind of shows some really uh, deft blending uh, to me where, where you do get the best of both worlds between sherry and some of those tropical fruits still coming through. And nothing seems to be getting stepped on. Like there's just layers and layers of different flavors on here that just stack up and, and just like form a line nicely and, and just run through your palate uh, in a really, really well done manner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think this is a very well put together bottling. Um, and I agree with Kurt. I'm a huge fan of the 25. And, and sadly, I suspect the days of, $350 Buna having 25 year old or long behind us, which is uh, why, uh, you know, Kurt, I know I'm not alone in this. Uh, some of us tucked away a couple of bottles for uh, posterity's sake. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a lovely whiskey, very well put together. You know, I don't know for me that this has the complexity quite of the 45 year old, but it's, it's elegant and rich. And the sherry notes are, as, as you said, Evan, they're they're very well balanced they're not over the mm -hmm. top it's very well very very well put together yeah it's, it's got one of the most terrible things that uh an expensive whiskey can, can have is in, in the how it's put together makes it very very dangerously drinkable mm -hmm. where there mm -hmm. there's there's not a, a rough edge to it and it's juicy and it, it it stays exciting at the same time to the point where you want to drink more of it mm -hmm. yeah. I, I just did that i poured half half the bottle about half the sample and I just pour the rest. I'm like, I'm just, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Might as well just bite the bullet, get it over with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so Mike, on to the subject of the 25, because obviously, I, and I'm assuming Canada for, for whatever reasons, continued to have the old 25 longer than almost anywhere else in the world. Yep. Um, and not only that, you know, going back to pricing on it, it was priced under, like I was seeing prices for the new Buna having 25 around a thousand dollars US. Um, you know, the new ones listed around three, 325 pounds in the UK, but certainly well more than what we were charging for it here. I'm assuming, and even though we know you've stepped back from your role, that the uh, that stock of old Buna having has probably been depleted by now. It's gone. Uh, so when, when I was there, we actually held most of those awesome wood box bunas for Canada. And mm -hmm. that was a reason why we kept seeing it, even though they discontinued it in the UK. Um, the last batch of it actually went to uh, BC. So the last of the old went to BC um, mm -hmm. and we won't see it again. The new ones have like a, I don't know what it is. I have it back there. It's similar to the Bunna 30 boxing um, that slides out and new, new bottles on completely as well. You mean this? Yeah. Yeah. And Mike, Jeff is wondering, um, how have we gotten this far into a Buna tasting and nobody's asked any questions on the 12 year old? The 12 year old <laughs> cask strength. Cask strength, sorry. Yes, the, the, the cask strength is key because the 12 year old we get, I mean, it's frequently out which is more of a PMA thing because for whatever reason they get stock in and then they put it on an LTO and then, Oh man, it's all gone. What happened? Um, but the 12 year old cast strength, Mike, um, what is the deal on that? Um, so it's a limited release every year. And I've heard that Canada is getting some or is to get some, but mm. um, I don't know when, um, mm. It could be next year. Uh, it could be maybe the release after that. But I know even like prior to my departure uh, as brand ambassador for Bunna and, and the other distilleries, uh, a lot of these limit editions were to come to Canada before I left, uh, but none of them came. 
Um, it all depends on the agency. The agency, de it depends on them if they want to bring it in. Um, and of course, a lot of these distilleries and the brands coming to Canada are price, are, the price are going higher. Like we, you all see it when it's coming into retail, even if wholesale, like it's, it's gone up. Um, you see, it's still a deal for Bunna 12 regular in Alberta, but eventually you're going to see it climb up even more. But the 12 cash franc was, I think, a vision of, of, you know, Brendan McCarran really showcasing sort of like the hidden depths of what Bunna is. And you see a lot of these independent bottlers bring out some cool younger Bunnas. And I think he wants to showcase what, you know, Bunna can do on their own too. And I've, I have a bottle coming. Uh, I'm a huge Bonna fan. So I, if, if I can get one, I'll get one. Uh, so I have a bottle coming so I can try it and see, but I'm sure it's pretty amazing uh, in the end. Um, so we're pretty close to wanting to do our vote here. And then I have some final comments that I want to make about one of the whiskeys and pricing before we get there. Um, but I've gone back through them and it's interesting to see I think my initial instincts on a couple of them have held up throughout the tasting, but um, Evan, Mike, I was wondering for you guys, if you've noticed any changes, um, subtle or otherwise, going back and revisiting them as we go around the horn. For me, the uh, like going back to the signatory 73, some of those savory notes have blown off and it's gotten a lot sort of more fruity and delicate, but still has a really good backbone to it structure wise uh i think that's showing better and better yeah it's it's gone back to that tropical place where it was when i wrote my tasting note um so it's nice to see that that has evolved back um into what i thought it was or something closer to it mike how about you i was gonna say the same thing the signatory 73 is like blown up on a whole other level um on the nose but the port askeg it's like i feel like i'm on a tropical island going back and nosing that as it oxidized a bit more, it's like, wow, yeah. it's, uh, that's a great, great, yeah. great whiskey. It's a desert island dram. It's, it's not the one you take with you. It's the one you find there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's tee up the poll here. Um, so I should warn you before you jump into the poll, Chelsea was kind enough to put this together before we did the tasting and she went with an earlier version on the order in the lineup. So um, it is somewhat out of order, but hopefully you're still in a position where you can remember what your favorites were. So here we go. And you get to vote twice, I believe. She's got this teed up. So you get your first favorite and your second favorite dram of the night. Um, we'll wait till the votes are in before we start, uh, we start uh, sharing our own favorites. So some of those may have bled through already. In, well, my uh, fully, in my time at uh, Kensington, I've realized that it's not a Kensington tasting. It's like something doesn't go slightly awry. So now I just yeah. start planting things incorrectly yeah. just to see if people are paying That's attention. That's right. Yeah, I'm looking for the word panty in there somewhere, but I'm not seeing it. <laughs> um, there's I there's say, a story like, behind is, that one. Yeah, there's, uh, <laughs> this isn't a poll anymore. This is a skill testing question for everybody. Now. It's a panty poll. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, um, that that got me thinking of a classic Simpsons reference, which I'll spare you of, but it involves the mispronunciation of the word possibly. Please anyway, don't spare us. <laughs> yeah, no, we'll we'll leave it there for now. We won't we won't delve into that tonight. Um, but Mike, I was thinking, do you have like one little Bunahaven story that maybe you haven't shared tonight that you want to? I just realize I'm kind of putting you on the spot here. Um, like our favorite memory you have of, you know, your, your years as the Buna Haven brand ambassador. Um, I gotta say that I have a few, um, but it, I think for me it was creating experiences that people can remember and uh, going back to Victoria whiskey festival. Um, I organized a small group uh, to go out to a private mansion and I picked them up at the hotel and as we were going, I said, okay, everyone turn off your phones because there's no pictures, no nothing. Cause I want it to be an experience. Um, so there's a gentleman that lent me his mansion, 
right by the water, overseeing the sea. And we took an experience about Bonahaven. Now, I wanted to replicate your time getting to the distillery. So getting to this gentleman's house was a heck of a journey because it was a single track road going up hills and going through steep, steep um, uh, uh, valleys. And it was tough, but we got there. But the whole thing was about the experience. So we got there. I had a lineup of whiskeys and not being able to take a picture, uh, not being able to like brag about what you're tasting uh, was the experience because you actually focused on the whiskey. You focused on the experience. You focused on the, the, the environment and looking out into the water. So I wanted to replicate being up on a Havan, but in Victoria, BC. And I think that's mm -hmm. probably one of my most memorable ones because oh. If I would have said take pictures, it would have been awesome on social media. I would have looked like a rock star, but I wanted to say no pictures. Let's just mm -hmm. take it in a moment. So that's a, that's a great story, Mike. Um, but it's not where I thought you were going from when you mentioned a house in Victoria, because I <laughs> yeah. instinctively was thinking of the Glenfiddich Balvini orgy house rentals during the yeah. Victoria Whiskey yeah. Festival. The, the 70s orgy house. Now, to be fair, the <laughs> Balvini Glenfiddich people were not specifically having an orgy, but rather they rented an orgy house with, you know, for the purposes of entertaining people during so they their They didn't visit. tell us this when I was the sales rep, so oh, somebody's going to have to fill me in on the details. There was there was shag carpeting and... I feel like it goes with the panty um, comment that I now yeah. will never live down, so I need to know. <laughs> yeah, it was a, it's, a, it's an interesting property. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that Good was an uh, interesting time. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like it, you're staying there, aren't you? That's where you're going no, tomorrow. No, no. <laughs> I actually wanted to go to Victoria, but I'm literally in BC for two nights. Um, so it's not enough time to jump over. Well, Mike, right. I don't, I, before uh, I, I put the poll live there for people that want to see it, but. Uh, before we get into other stuff, do you want to share a little bit about what you're uh, up to now career wise with everybody? Well, um, with leaving my brand ambassador role, I, I still wanted to stay connected to the community. And that was my big thing as a brand ambassador. If you saw me at a whiskey show, um, I was mostly with, uh, you know, the whiskey enthusiast. Uh, if there was a hotel room party, I'd be there with a bottle and share something. And I still wanted to stay connected. So while I was a brand ambassador, um, I started the Whiskey Explorer Society and it just really wasn't bought on by the agency. There was no interest in it. And I, well, I took it. And after leaving, I wanted to really stay connected. So I started the Whiskey Explorer Society here in Canada. And it, it's not really a career move. It's more of a sense to keep me educated in whiskey um, and stay connected. So doing whiskey tastings, um, I guess part of that, I'm able to fly to Vancouver and taste the generation's 80 year Gordon McPhail on Saturday night. So that gives me the opportunity to kind of branch out. Um, I'm a whiskey geek. Uh, I love Bunna and I loved my experience and the opportunity to represent and be the face of the brand for six years. Uh, if I could stay that as a brand ambassador for Bunna, I would. Um, but I still want to stay connected and I'm able to dive in some amazing whiskeys and, and share my thoughts and be honest about it. Uh, so that's kind of like where my venture is, um, leading tastings, sharing knowledge, uh, sharing history of distilleries, but diving into some distilleries that people may not know. Like I did a flora and fauna tasting. I thought that was amazing because 13 different whiskeys where you may not be able to taste ever again because they're depleting more and more and more. So yeah, my journey is about more education, knowledge, and, and, and sharing and experiences. I have some plans of in-person tastings and, and kind of celebrate Canada as well. So uh, I'm planning something in Dawson city, Yukon in lounge, the meadows, mm -hmm. Newfoundland and uh, a few other places, but connecting Canadians and whiskey uh, is kind of like a, a um, something I see that I want to really pursue. Right on. Well, and a good way to stay in touch with all the people that you've met over the years and your job as the Boone Haven brand ambassador too. Well, very, very cool, Mike. Um, all right, Mike, I'm going to put you on the spot here. What were your two favorite whiskeys in tonight's tasting? I'm, I'm going to say the uh, Signatory Bona 73 and the Port Askeg 45. Cool. 
Very, very cool. Evan, how about yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm with Mike on that, on the Signatory 73. Um, I would say I really enjoyed the 45 Portis gig, but I think the, uh, the single malt of Scotland 43 actually topped it for me. Yeah, that's a tough, that's a toughie. Um, Chelsea, do you have favorites? Uh, my favorites are the SMOS 43 and the Port Askeg 45. Very cool. And Kurt, you didn't taste any of these, but based on just listening to tonight's tasting, what were your favorites? Uh, I'm so, I can't lie. I did nose through these bottles as they were being poured. Um, and when they were done being poured, oftentimes there's a little dribble in there that I got to taste a little bit of. Um, and I, a couple of these I'd have had a couple times. The Port of Skeg 45, I just love. I'm with Andrew on this one. Um, just a beautiful old whiskey that's mellow, almost to the point of not being whiskey anymore. So I think these are the ones we're just grateful for that made it over the cut. Um, so that one out of this lineup is probably my favorite. And then I really, really, really dug that 78 signatory when I have it, what I tasted of it. So I'm kind of looking forward to going and properly having 73. Mm -hmm. um, so my favorites, thanks for asking. Um, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Um, you know, I'm still stuck on the port asking 45. Um, I, I really love that the 43 from single malts of Scotland, it's just really bright, really tropical, really fruity. Um, I think my bias is creeping in and I, there's part of me that wants to see that 78 signatory, you know, on the podium. So I think my number two is probably going to go to that, even though in my heart, if I was given a chance to drink, if I had to drink one of them on a desert island, it would probably be that 43. Did you, did you experience a little um, period of anxiety between when, you know, that bottle of 45 was opened and when your replacement showed up? <laughs> Were you like, damn it, I left mine into the hands of these people and I don't have one now. That's a good point because the shipment that arrived was late and we wanted to pour it for the tasting. And the only way to do that and include it was to, to, was to take my bottle and hopefully replace it at a future date. So yeah, there was a little bit of anxiety, but <laughs> I, I knew it would all get sorted out eventually. Um, on that note, it's probably a good thing for me to bring up a final comment on that. The, that Port Askig 45 year old um, was originally considerably cheaper than it is now. It was about 1800 retail. Um, I think we now have it listed for 34. Does that sound right, Evan? Yeah, that um, does sound about right. So um, we, and even then we've only got about three or four of them in stock. Um, I am willing to do a one-time, one, one night only special on that of 15% off for, for anyone who wants one. Um, and there's only three or four of them left in store. I don't think we have any more. And when we get any in the future, the price might be going up again. And a part of that is just a recognition on the part of the owners of that brand that it probably was priced too low when they first released it, that it's stock that's incredibly rare now and very special and we'll never see again. Um, so that's something that if you're digging that, if you want something like that on your bar in your collection, I wouldn't wait because the opportunities to acquire it and the price are not going to go down. Um, I think almost everything else in tonight's lineup, this is unusual, except for that 30 year old are available for purchase. Um, they are limited. There's not a lot of stuff out there, but if you do order a bottle tonight, um, you can order them online or you can wait till Evan or I are back in store and send one of us an email. Um, we'll be happy to give you a 10% discount if you want to purchase any of them, 15 off that, that port ass gig. But uh, yeah, this was a cool tasting. I hope you enjoyed it. This was one of our marquee final tastings of the 2021. It's still 2021, right? 2021 session, COVID and dates and all that. They blended together. I know Evan and I have been joking about that for a while. Um, this is one of our last tastings, unless you have a whiskey calendar, in which case there's five more tastings in December coming up. Um, if you don't have a whiskey calendar, bad news, they're sold out and we can't make any more. So that's not going to happen either. Um, but we will have some new tastings coming up. Our winter tasting schedule will likely be up very early in December. 
So stay tuned on that. We've been batting around ideas. We've got things in the hopper. Um, apparently we're going to do whiskey autopsies. Um, that's a thing that we came, came out, came out with tonight. Um, we do have one tasting left though. That's worth plugging actually two. two. There might be, yeah, the society tasting. I think there's still a few tickets left for next month by next month. I mean, Thursday next week. Um, the week after that, there's the doers blends tasting and I'm not kidding. The lineup on that is phenomenal. The 27, the 21, and the uh, 32. Um, I know people don't get excited when they think of doers, um, but that might be a mistake because I think they're, other than Compass Box, they might be doing the best job of trying to bring, make make blended whiskey sexy again. Um, yeah, that, that 32 is crazy good. It mm -hmm. is superb. And, you know, we're going to have a little fun because we've got their, their eight-year-old range, which has got the rum finish and the mezcal finish and the, what's the other one? The Portuguese finish, the port finish. They're all smooth. So we had a little fun with that, you know. Do we have many spots left in that doer's one, Andrew? We, I, shockingly, we do. I, there's 21 looking at it here, which is kind of crazy. I don't understand with how much like heat we had for that 32 and how many people were trying to buy cases of it in multiples and stuff. And, and also with my Zohan reference <laughs> that I'm extremely proud of, mm -hmm. I, I don't, <laughs> I don't see how that tasting's not sold out yet. Um, all I joking think, aside though, Andrew, I, you ran around the whole store telling people the Zohan <laughs> reference and you weren't excited until somebody got it. I, was I would just like to say that I got it right away. Store. There was only one person in the store who'd actually two. seen don't mess with the Zoge 2. There was two people. Uh, the, the rest of us don't want to actually recognize that we know who Anders, Adam Sandler is anymore. Uh, oh, sadly. <laughs> but that's some of his I can't remember who start. the second person was. Yeah. But I thought your Zohan reference was funny, but apparently it wasn't good enough. <laughs> uh, apparently it was too lowbrow for some, I suppose. Anyway. I'm looking forward to that tasting because if you haven't tried that Doers 32, it is it is off the chains and it is cheap. It is cheap for how good that whiskey is. Yep. So anyway, that's a tasting worth hitting. Mike, um, I want to say a huge thank you again to you for um, tuning in tonight um, and taking part in tonight's tasting and agreeing to do this with us, um, adding some credibility to an otherwise unruly group of Kensington folk that just <laughs> talk about random things that often have nothing to do with the whiskeys we're tasting. Um, so thank you very much for doing that. I look forward to seeing you. Right, just out of curiosity, you, will you be going to the Victoria Whiskey Festival this year? I no? Be, uh, no? Okay. Well, I'm, I might be coming out east. There's been requests for me to, to, to make a pilgrimage to the greater Montreal, Ottawa area, Cornwallish. Um, so that might happen at some point. We'll see. But uh, otherwise, uh, thank you again for this tonight. If I don't see you before or talk to you, have a very Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. And thank you um, for really sharing your passion for Bunahaven tonight. My pleasure. My pleasure. And uh, Evan, I got some lechic to send you. That's going to get Yeah, really that's, that's music to my ears, man. <laughs> I thought you guys were friends. <laughs> Evan, please share. Yeah. <laughs> Mike, <Yeah>. share. <laughs> you get some. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, to everyone who tuned in, who bought a ticket tonight's tasting, thank you. I hope you enjoyed the lineup and the range. Um, if Evan and Chelsea and Mike want to hang around and keep chatting with people, you guys are welcome to do that. I am going to sign off though shortly because it's been a bit of a long one for me. Um, and at that point, I'm going to at least to the very least kill the Facebook and, um, the recording, but I will do my best not to hit end tasting, which mm -hmm. I have done once before. <laughs> I'll, uh.